Hello, welcome to Mr. Faye's Science Basement, where we are still talking about evolution. Uh, now, we've talked a little bit about the natural history timeline, which basically is a long time. Uh, we've talked about mutations when we talked about genetics, uh, and we've also talked about fossils, how they're formed, and the way that they're correlated, both through relative dating and absolute dating. Uh, today, we're going to look at some more inferences that can be made from the fossil record. Um, namely, we're going to take a look at transitional forms. Uh, and if we have time, we'll also take a look at some comparative anatomy. This is the journal entry that we're going to be using. Um, you have a printout in the Google Classroom. You can do it digitally. You can print it out and write on it with a pen and, and, or a pencil, uh, cut it out and glue it in. Or if you would just like to write in your journals uh, freestyle and uh, make some sketches along the way, I think all of those things uh, would be fine. So I say we get right to it. Anytime you're looking at transitional forms, this is like the most common transitional form that science teachers will reference when they're talking about this trend when we look in the fossil record. Transitional forms are examples in the fossil record that show trends or changes, or at least suggest trends and changes over time. So uh, the, the most common example is the modern day horse. This right here is the modern day horse. Go back 50 million years into the fossil record, that is a species that's kind of like a mini horse. It's got many of the same characteristics, but some of the characteristics are different. Now, those two things by themselves, that's kind of interesting. I guess it just says that long ago, horses used to be littler and, and have you know different characteristics, or maybe you don't think that, you just think it's a completely different species. But the part that makes it interesting is if you go back and look at the time frame, that if you look at fossils that aren't 50 million years old, but are slightly younger, that's what appears. And even more recent to today, that's what appears. And if you go back even less far, that's what appears until this is what we have appear over today. So if we look at fossils correlated in the record, we can see species that are similar and also showing a trend over that time frame that we have. And some of them are obvious, like this shows size. But if you look at other characteristics in there, you can also see uh, other characteristics appearing to have a trend or changing over time. Uh, if you look at their bone structure, it's actually more interesting as far as I'm concerned. Uh, this right here is showing a, a hoof or a foot of um, these species here. If you take a look at the earliest fossils from that right there, about 50 million years ago, take a look at these uh, the digits right here, these little projections that you see, you can see that they're all separate and they actually separate all the way up into the, the foot or that hoof-like structure. Um, but if you go more recently, you're going to see that we definitely have a change. So it's different. Okay, the two middle ones appear to fuse together and these two um, on the outside seem to remain apart. Go several million years more in the fossil record, these two become more pronounced and these become less pronounced. And then what the fossils that we find of this species here have them completely fused together. It looks like we might have a couple little nubbins here. And when we look at the modern day horse and, and compare them, we'll notice that many of the bones are still there, but again, they're changing in proportion. So that's a great example of just not something conclusive, but something that you can infer might show a change over time where one might be the ancestor of another. So in my opinion, the horse thing is a little bit boring because that information has been around for a long time and it's been, been in the science books for as long as I can remember. Um, this is kind of interesting because thoughts on dinosaurs have changed even with, within my own lifetime, really in the last 20, 25 years. Um, that is the stereotypical picture that you would have of a dinosaur. It's actually a velociraptor. In fact, it might even be a picture of a velociraptor from the movie Jurassic Park. This was a common theme for almost a hundred years as to what dinosaurs look like, looking like terrible lizards, okay? Uh, monsters, if you will. But as more and more fossils came in of dinosaurs, we started to find not only more detail in those fossils, but we also started to find some transitional forms. This is a very old fossil that I remember even from when I was little of a specimen called Archaeopteryx. And it was always kind of viewed as this weird little outlier because it had some characteristics of dinosaurs. But if you look really carefully, um, we have fossilized 
uh, plumage here or feathers appearing around the outside of the skeleton. Now this was always viewed as its own um, species because there was not really a whole lot of other evidence that showed like dinosaurs having feathers up until relatively recently. Over the last 20 years there's been several examples of dinosaurs um, that we used to think didn't have feathers and looked more like our traditional Jurassic Park dinosaurs um, but actually have found that they indeed might have transitional forms that can link some species of dinosaurs to modern day birds. And I realize that this is oversimplified, but it definitely gives you that idea there. So the idea being uh, that dinosaurs all lines of dinosaurs are not extinct. Some of them have changed through transitional forms into uh, birds that we have today. And birds are very common and occupy almost every niche you can imagine. Um, on Earth. This gives us a very different view um, of the dinosaurs today. Again, you're going to find in most uh, textbooks that deal with paleontology, most um, of these types of species of dinosaurs are actually um, now represented with feathers or, or plumage on them. Something that's interesting, there's actually so much data on this plumage now uh, from various fossils that they can actually go and take a look at the protein structures and actually start to make good inferences about the color of these feathers too, which is suggesting that these might not only be covered in feathers, but also be colorful, uh, which is something that you wouldn't think about, at least if you were a kid growing up in the 1970s and 80s, we always viewed them as big green monsters. Okay, so not only do we have a good deal of evidence when we look in the fossil record, um, of thousands of fossils showing trends over time that correlate with their age. But we also see a lot of really interesting things uh, in species that are now alive um, that could really lend us to the idea that um, species are a lot more related that you think than you think, and uh, they have a lot of things that are kind of like transitional forms um, existing today. And we're going to take a look at some of the, the um, comparative anatomy of some uh, vertebrates here. And namely, let's see, are these all mammals? Yes, every single one of these is a mammal. Um, now, before we start, let me tell you the suggestion that is made by this um, comparative anatomy here. And it is that humans, cats, whales, and bats um, are related. In other words, they're built on a similar uh, platform. They have similarities. And scientists think that that points to the idea that they have come about from a common ancestor. So a, wat, or a, a cat doesn't turn into a person or a monkey doesn't per, turn into a person. Nobody really thinks that at all, who understands evolution. They think that these animals right here, because of their bone structure, share some sort of common ancestry. So let's take a peek. Um, they get kind of more fascinating as you go. So if you know anything about human anatomy, uh, this is the basic layout of the bones in, in the arm and hand. Okay, got your humerus, your radius, your ulna that allows it to pivot. There's your wrist bones in there. They're called your carpals, your metacarpals, and your phalanges or your fingers, okay, that you wiggle around like that. Something that's kind of interesting is even though a cat ex on the exterior looks really, really different, these bones are actually still present. They're just modified slightly. So they're still there. We still have a humerus, radius, all that, and all these types of things. But if you'll take a look, those are, they're put together a little bit differently in a little different proportion. So you know like a cat is able to spread out its, you know, like claws a little bit, that can, nowhere near what like a person can, but it definitely has some similarities in structure. Now to me that's not that fascinating until you get to the whale. So the whale really on the exterior has a flipper, okay, something that really doesn't have mobility like this or the ability to pick up or anything. Um, but if you take a look at the structure inside, a lot of the same bones are present. They're just present in a different configuration with different proportions. So you have a humerus, a radius, and ulna. You have the wrist bones. You have the metacarpals and the phalanges. However, many of them are fused and don't really move. The idea is they don't move anymore 
they're built on a common platform or common ancestry um, that shows that we all have some relation to each other, which is kind of an interesting thing. Again, looking at a very different structure like a bat wing, we see that all of the same bones again are present. So you can see the humerus, radius, all nuts, very small right there. Uh, but you do have your metacarpals and phalanges. So even though they're used really differently and they look really different, there is a shadow of like DNA or platform commonality between them that shows that they could be related to a common ancestor, um, which helps to build this theory of how things may have uh, evolved on the planet. One of my favorite things to look at, which to me is so convincing when I think about this idea of life changing over time, is this idea of vestigial structures or structures that are present but no longer used by an organism, which then suggests that at one time they were used or they existed in a different way. A great example is to take the mammal, the whale. Now we just looked at a whale and we know that if you look inside a whale's flipper, you actually find all the bones that are evident in the hand and arm and all those types of things. So you got a shoulder blade right there or a scapula. It's pretty cool, right? But this right here is absolutely fascinating. If you go back along the spinal column of a whale and get to about here, which you might be able to see this area right here. Let's see if I can draw on that. I should be able to. Whales have a floating bone or fl a floating bone structure in there that is actually proportional to a hip and a femur or a thigh bone. Um, this serves no purpose in the whale whatsoever. It isn't even connected anymore, I guess we could say, to the, the rest of the skeleton, but that still exists in the whale. And that idea, the inference that can be made from that is that it's because the whale is, has a common ancestor with things that have four legs. Uh, so in other words, this may have um, an ancestor way back in its background that did have four legs, and you're viewing the whale as it is right now, moving away from having four legs. So it's like, it's like evolution as it's happening, and you're watching that. And the idea is that generation over generation, maybe that, that structure would get smaller. That, that's an interesting inference to make. I mean, it's a jump, but it is an inference to make. Um, we do see things like this even in our own bodies, like our tailbone is a bunch of fused together vertebrae, like you would find in the tails of other primates. Um, we have weird things like um, wisdom teeth and things like that, that, even arguably possibly the appendix, uh, structures that may have served a purpose at a different time. Um, when our bodies may have been structured a little bit differently, um, but we have changed over time. Pretty cool when you think about it. All right, one of the final things we're going to look at is comparative anatomy through embryology, or in other words, looking at embryos as they um, develop in um, different, let me check and see here, they're not all mammals, but they are all vertebrates, which means that they all have, um, they all have a backbone or vertebra uh, as you're looking your way through. So um, when we're talking about a um, embryo we're talking about after conception when you have a zygote which is a single cell that zygote then turns into a ball of cells and then it starts to differentiate into the different tissues so once you've gone through a certain amount of differentiation you become an embryo okay and we've seen pictures of human embryos and they're kind of scary they actually creep me out quite a little bit um, but we do notice that if we take a look at embryos from different vertebrates um, at similar points points in um, gestation and development, we're going to notice like some really weird similarities. Uh, like all for the fish and the reptile and the bird and the human, each have like a tail evident at some point uh, in that process. So as you can see, especially between like the bird and the human, there's a lot going on here with that uh, tail structure. Now the idea is not that humans have tails or this is evolving through the steps of evolution. The idea is the DNA is still evident to some degree during development um, to have a tail. Uh, that DNA or genes, they just aren't expressed during development, which is kind of 
an interesting thing. Another one I want to point to really quickly is where when you're looking at fish and where the gill slits um, actually start to form for the gills for the fish that allow for uh, respiration, uh, taking in an oxygen and, the, and giving off the carbon dioxide. Um, we see the same thing in reptiles. We see the same tissue here, but we also see the same tissue develop these slits up here by the neck, which is kind of weird in birds. And we also see them as in humans, these similar structures of gill slits. Now we know that humans don't have gills, but it does show that it might be simply a modification of this area of the embryo that gets expressed um, during human development. So it's actually this tissue that will end up kind of turning around, working its way in and becoming the lungs of, of the human as the human develops. So what's the point? Like what's the purpose of the discussion? Let me just wrap this up really quickly. We're trying to look at this theory of evolution and how it could possibly come to be. We've looked at the fact that we have a lot of time in the natural history timeline. We've looked and seen that mutations are possible on a very small scale, but you need a lot of time, which we have. Um, we've seen that every time we dig into the ground and find fossils, they're all of things that don't exist today. And when we start to correlate those and put them in order in which they appear to have existed, we do see transitional forms. And when we look at things that are living today, we see these similarities and, and vestigial structures and embryological uh, similarities that hint that we could be related um, to a common ancestor. So hopefully that will um, get you started at least thinking about uh, evolution and how it might work, but we have a lot of work to do. So um, keep your eyes open for more videos.